you guys opened up the room? Yeah. Great. Welcome, everybody, uh, to this week's Cyber Policy Center weekly workshop. We are thrilled to have my longtime friend and uh, esteemed colleague, Spencer Overton, uh, to deliver the talk today. Uh, Spencer has, he's, he, he's been um, sort of a power player in, in legal academic circles, and I define that in the same way we would athletes, which is like you've, you've not only uh, uh, you know, been accomplished as an academic, but served as principal deputy uh, assistant attorney general in the um, uh, early Obama administration, has been, has directed the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies uh, on the outside, studied, uh, uh, started the website blackprof.com, uh, uh, and has been at the forefront of academic uh, inquiry on questions of democracy. I will say that we, we've known each other for well over uh, two decades now, um, starting in the area of campaign finance where he's written some uh, critically important uh, work. Uh, but I'm thrilled to see that he's moved into um, the research de dealing with tech uh, and democracy, and he's going to present today uh, his most recent uh, uh, work in progress, uh, which is uh, titled Anticipating Racial Harms to Democracy uh, from AI. As also, always, we'll, um, he'll talk for around a half an hour. We'll have uh, questions from the audience in here, but those of you who are on Zoom can also put uh, your questions into the Q&A uh, uh, feature in Zoom, and it will magically appear on my cell phone. So please join me in welcoming Spencer Overton. Good afternoon, Nate. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks to the Stanford Cyber Policy Center for having me here. Uh, I'm here. To, I'm happy to be here for several reasons. One is obviously my personal and professional relationship with Nate. Uh, we started teaching at about the same time, uh, and you know he's really having an impact both inside the academy and outside the academy. Uh, he, just he's so connected to so many communities, whether it's political scientists, election law academics, political parties, big tech, philanthropy, many more. His insights are always valuable. Nate, you know, I, I, I just really appreciate uh, our friendship uh, here. Uh, and, and obviously, he's got a great team. Ben and Michelle were outstanding in terms of helping me get uh, situated. Uh, I'm also happy to be here because of the role of Stanford in the development of AI. You'll remember that the foundations of AI and the US civil rights movement occurred about the same time in the 1950s and 1960s. And in 1965, the year that Congress passed both the Voting Rights Act and the Immigration and Naturalization Act, Stanford scholars created the first AI system that replicated the decision making of human experts. Uh, and much more has happened since, including the policy contributions of my colleague Daphne Keller uh, here, right? So uh, I'm also happy to be here for personal reasons that I just have to quickly mention. Five years after that Stanford breakthrough in 1970, my older cousin, Ron Alexander, came here to teach documentary filmmaking at Stanford's Department of Communication. Uh, I only met him when I came here for the first time in 1990. Uh, over the years, he was really a significant mentor and influence on my life. Uh, every time I'd be in the area, I'd be at his, his Menlo Park house, and uh, you know, students loved him. I did as well. And uh, he, he passed away about seven years ago, in, uh, at the age of 94. And so, you know, I'm just grateful for his generosity, uh, as well as that of uh, his neighbor Ginger Holt, who you know, just, just looked out for him and made sure that he could live independently. So uh, I'm looking forward to getting your all's insights on my current work in progress, um, anticipating the racial harms to democracy of AI. So you all know this, uh, a basic principle of many existing AI frameworks is uh, anticipating and mitigating risk uh, here. Uh, we've seen this in the White House blueprint for the AI Bill of Rights, uh, the NIST AI Risk Management Framework, uh, the proposed uh, Algorithmic Accountability Act uh, has some uh, uh, both pre-deployment and post-deployment uh, assessment requirements. Uh, the 
EU AI Act anticipates the risks of particular AI applications and tailors the amount of regulation to the level of risk. My research project attempts to build on this principle and anticipate racial harms of AI to U.S. democracy. Uh, by AI, I mean existing and emerging forms of AI, Nate, including generative AI, which I consider to be a significant advance in narrow AI. So I do not mean uh, future generations of AI that some are anticipating, like artificial general intelligence that mimics a human being's general ability to perform tasks across multiple domains. I don't mean AI that operates outside of human uh, control. Uh, another note up front, I certainly believe that AI has a lot of uh, opportunity to just do good things for democracy, uh, like making it more racially inclusive by lowering costs, increasing voter engagement and mobilization, enabling cross-racial deliberation and collaboration and coalitions. And my, my next Law Review article is going to focus on some of those issues and how the law might help facilitate uh, those opportunities. But today, I'm focused on anticipating harms. And let me provide a little context as to why I think anticipating racial harms in the U.S. Uh, uh, is particularly important. Uh, now, now, there might be some people who say, hey, deep fakes affect everyone, not just people of color. I, I call this the, you know, all lives matter outlook, right? Uh, a variation on this is that race is largely a relic of the past. And, these are fair questions, and so uh, just in terms of historical and contemporary uh, social context is really important to anticipating the risks of, of any uh, uh, AI, uh, particularly in downstream uh, applications uh, like uses by society uh, generally. Uh, so now, at the, at the ratification of the U.S. Constitution, about, about 1788, the U.S. was a multiracial society. 18% uh, of the population was black, uh, according to the census in 1790. But, but we weren't a, a multiracial democracy. And it was because our laws and institutions were designed to entrench white rule. The, the Constitution subsidized slavery through, through several provisions. And most states, including those outside of the South, limited voting to white males or would eventually do so. The Naturalization Act of 1790 limited U.S. citizenship to, quote, free white persons, end of quote, and federal officials would continue to effectively gerrymander the racial composition of the U.S. population to ensure white Democratic majorities uh, you know, using the, the law regulating citizenship, immigration, statehood, well into the 20th century, and, and obviously those majorities persist to this day. Uh, yes, we did have a real attempt at building a ma uh, multiracial democracy in the aftermath of the Civil War, but that was very uh, short-lived. And, and just to be clear, when I use the term uh, multiracial democracy, Daphne. I mean liberal democracy with a racially and ethnically diverse population that protects the political rights of all individuals and uh, from, from all, all groups. Now, over the past six decades, the U.S. has moved toward becoming a multiracial democracy thanks to those two laws I mentioned before. Voting Rights Act and the Immigration and Naturalization Act of 1965. Voting Rights Act makes real the 15th Amendment's uh, prohibition on discrimination in terms of voting uh, based on race. It was expanded in 1975 to include language minorities. The Immigration and Naturalization Act of 1965 explicitly barred racial discrimination in the immigration admissions process and repealed race and national origin-based quotas that overwhelmingly favored Northern and Western Europe. Um, so, now these two laws started to transform the United States into a multiracial democracy, 
the percentage of immigrants in the U.S., for example, from European countries. In 1960, Beth, it was 75 percent. By 2016, that had dropped to 11 percent, right? People of color have grown as a share of the U.S. population. Uh, in, uh, it was 15 percent in 1960, 41 percent in 2020, and it's anticipated that it will continue to grow. Uh, another uh, indication is, is this political change we've seen. This blue line shows the growth of black state legislators in the South following the passage of the Voting Rights Act. It's compared to a red line which follows uh, really just the end of Reconstruction here. And you see this uh, decline of black state legislatures uh, in the South. But you see this increase as a result of the Voting Rights Act uh, uh, here. Uh, in 1945, people of color accounted for less than 1% of the members of the U.S. House and Senate combined, and today they make up over a quarter of uh, members. Now, so a lot of progress toward being a, a multiracial democracy. But as our nation has become more racially diverse, our party politics have become more racially divided. Race is the most significant demographic factor that shapes voting patterns in the United States. And you can see from, from this uh, graph, it's, it's more significant than class, than sexual orientation, religion, marital status, uh, age, uh, gender, uh, education uh, here. Uh, these are just a, a couple of elections, but if you look at other elections, you see similar gaps. And here you'll see the gaps aren't just between whites and blacks, but also some significant gaps in terms of uh, Latinos and, and Asian Americans as, as well. There's another way of looking at this issue uh, here, which is that Democrats have become much more diverse as our nation has become more diverse. And, and Republicans initially became more diverse, but they started to flatline in about the 1990s in terms of the rate of increase in terms of uh, diversity here. I uh, want to focus on another uh, quick issue here from a context standpoint. And so there's also this separate issue of kind of white solidarity growing as political identity. Uh, political scientist Ashley Jardina found that 30 to 40 percent of the white population in the United States heavily identifies with their in-group as white. Now, while most folks who identify heavily do not harbor racial resentment against people of color, uh, they often perceive, according to Jardina, quote, uh, they perceive significant competition from racial and ethnic minorities, end of quote, and, and quote, believe that their group should work collectively on behalf of its interests to preserve their status. She found that white identity is, quote, becoming a more salient force in American politics because many in this group feel as though they're losing power and status due to demographic changes of the last 30 years. Uh, she and other social scientists have found that, uh, that ethnic antagonism, one hand, and also solidarity correlate with a willingness to abandon democratic norms to maintain status here. So another reason that we need to anticipate these racial harms is because in the past, as you all know, big tech has failed to do so. Racial bias is well documented in a wide range of machine learning applications. Uh, I won't go through them all. You all know what they uh, are. Um, so we need to anticipate racial harms to democracy of AI because we're at this critical juncture. Our population's changing. We're moving toward a well-functioning multiracial democracy, Glenn. But we've got racial polarization, cultural anxiety, some anti-democratic attitudes that are threatening our progress, and of course there's the age-old issue of political incumbents who want to entrench themselves uh, and, and maintain power, and as we mentioned, big tech hasn't sufficiently prevented racial harms in the past uh, here. 
So now, as we develop and regulate AI, I think we've got to think about how AI converges with at least uh, these challenges. There are likely more. Here are, are four big areas that I have grouped out, and I'm going to go through these quickly. In all of these areas, Michelle, the, the harms will likely be amplified by the increasing accessibility to generative AI due to factors like lower costs and due to factors, uh, due to tools like natural language prompts. So we've already witnessed lower tech versions of racial impersonation and infiltration of community deliberation. Uh, and generative AI could take these issues up several levels. You remember in 2016, uh, there were different pages. This is one, the, you know, uh, Williams and Calvin Facebook page. These were supposed to be two black men from Atlanta focused on black media and culture. Uh, they paid for this ad uh, just before election day which was, we don't have any other choice this time but to boycott the election. This time we choose between two races. No one represents black people. Don't go to vote. This, uh, only this way we can change the way of things, et cetera, et cetera, here, right? After the election, investigation revealed that this was actually the Russians. Uh, you see their, their targets, even though black folks make up about 13% of the population, they were over 37% of the uh, accounts that the Russians set up in terms of targeting particular groups as well <coughs> as ads. And they were almost, uh, black folks accounted for almost 50% of the uh, user uh, clicks and um, just short of 50% in terms of the user impressions here. So now, we've seen similar campaigns from foreign and domestic actors. Uh, and obviously, as we move into this new world, rather than rely just on social media account, account, uh, accounts of so still photos, et cetera, uh, racial impersonators will be able to do much more. Rather than racial, uh, or I'm sorry, rather than Russia, user-friendly and affordable deepfake technology will allow kind of a, a lone wolf 30-year-old male with few financial resources who is experiencing cultural anxiety to engage in this type of activity. Also, Russians used kind of predetermined Facebook uh, categories here uh, by, by Facebook for their ad targeting. Uh, generative AI will allow for more customized ads in terms of um, uh, being able to do more with less and create more content quickly and it will also uh, facilitate being able to engage with particular entities. We may even get to the point of AI iterating billions of data points until the most effective message or video is found for influencing the behavior of a particular individual of color in real time to the point of hyper-nudging or psychometric manipulation. Uh, now, this, this raises uh, certain issues in the context of race, you know, for people of color who have exter uh, internalized experiences like forced assimilation at Indian boarding schools, punishment for speaking Spanish at lunch in the cafeteria, employment termination for not straightening curly hair, and exclusion uh, of their cultural history from school textbooks, uh, you know, manipulation facilitated by generative AI can represent you know, a, a continuation of the, this conquest that, you know, understandably folks could feel violates values of autonomy, choice, expression, association, and equality that a liberal democracy purports to prioritize, right? Uh, another existing harm is that even the tools used to fight discrimination, AI tools used to fight discrimination, have bias. We've seen this in terms of social media content uh, moderation and kind of the disproportionate downranking and, and, and t account removals uh, of folks of color. Similar issue is in deep fake detection systems. So AI powered deep fake detection systems, which are much less effective on uh, people of color and accurate uh, here. Now, that's kind of that impersonation. That's like a, a group of, of, of harms. 
uh, this is another kind of subgroup here uh, under, under this, this first, this disinformation piece, is this concept of fueling uh, cultural anxiety and, and folks being able to tap into that. We've seen this in the past with other emerging technologies, uh, the major motion picture film, Birth of a Nation, uh, fueled lynchings in the South, uh, Peyton Gendron, uh, attempted to live stream his mass shooting at a grocery store uh, in a black Buffalo neighborhood to inspire similar incidents elsewhere. We can only imagine what someone may do with generative AI. So now, while I started with deep fakes, perhaps the most important message for today is that AI will affect all aspects of our democracy, so we need to call out uh, uh, harms in, throughout the process, right? So, for example, racial harms ex, uh, to democracy extend to warrantless government surveillance that chills the political speech of uh, people of color and their allies. We, we've seen this in terms of various forms of AI-powered tools being used to surveil activists of color, protesting issues like unjustified police violence or inhumane treatment of uh, immigrants. We've seen different companies like uh, uh, Mobile Walla, uh, Data Miner, and Geophedia use AI to collect and analyze data from mobile phones and from social media posts at Black Lives Matter protests and, and feed that information to uh, police uh, here. Um, so this can obviously chill speech and participation in particular communities. Another harm of AI is entrenching racial hierarchy through election structures. Now, sometimes this bias is inadvertent. Uh, so, for example, AI is increasingly used to automate a wide range of election administration functions, such as the purging of voting rolls, the authentic uh, authentic authentication of signatures to verify mail-in ballots, polling place selection, designing ballots, voice-activated uh, voter assistance, uh, and because of flawed data sets, some studies have shown racial disparities such as an erroneous and disproportionate uh, uh, rejection of mail-in ballots of voters with Asian and Spanish surnames. AI could also uh, facilitate more intentional targeting of people of color. So the Brennan Center and others have talked about the danger of AI-powered efforts that impair election administration, like cyber attacks on election offices, using text generators uh, to create thousands of uh, nuisance record requests or, or targeted harassment of election officials. Now, as we think about these harms, elections in the United States are administered on the local level. There are about 300 counties in the United States, and those are the, the dark uh, counties there. Uh, 300 counties that are majority uh, people of color. So an attack targeted at just a handful of county election offices in the right states, places like Florida, Georgia, Nevada, North Carolina, Virginia, could sufficiently hinder election processes and could, could possibly uh, shape outcomes. Uh, another uh, example is AI being used by political operatives to create even more sophisticated uh, gerrymandering and, and, and voting restrictions, so uh, districts uh, here. Uh, so more than previous redistricting algorithm systems, and, and I'll be able to get some feedback from this on Nate, from, from Nate, uh, uh, AI can capture context-dependent voting behavior, identify new patterns, more effectively mass proxy discrimination by identifying and analyzing discrete statistical characteristics and voting patterns uh, here. So now, the last harm I want to discuss today, and this is, uh, this is, um, some people may see this as a feature, feature rather than a bug, but I think we got to talk about it. I think that this is significant, and I, it's, it's, I just sent out a draft yesterday, so I'm sorry about just getting it to you all yesterday. This is scattered all over the draft, and so I'm kind of bringing it all here, right? So not only can election officials and political operatives use technology to entrench their preferred electoral outcomes, 
but the architecture of foundation models in and of itself fortifies political, cultural, language, and racial outlooks of uh, a past uh, here, right? Because foundation models are optimized to reflect their training data as accurately as possible to detect patterns, we should expect that they will reinforce stereotypes and unfair discrimination by default. So in the context of democracy, we could see this in terms of you don't have Asian and Spanish surnames here, and so when you do your signature matches, you have, uh, you know, you reject a, a disproportionate number of those mail-in ballots, the, the technology you use. But, but, but Nate, I think this isn't a narrow issue, and I, I need to research it more, but, you know, a very small share of the world's over 6,000 languages are represented in foundation models. English is by far the most dominant language. Uh, and the, the bias for English text in large language models could shape various aspects of US democracy, including language assistance uh, provided at the polls and, and civic education and debate. You all know the Voting Rights Act uh, already protects uh, certain groups here in terms of language minorities. But Spanish, even though it's very popular, it's less well represented in ter than, than, than English in terms of large language models. And then there's some languages, Native American languages, Alaska Native languages, Cambodian, Hmong, that are probably very unrepresented, underrepresented, if not unrepresented. Applications built on these foundation models may, may, may also struggle with language variation, including dialects of English spoken by some African Americans, Latinos, and Asian Americans. As a result, when we think about tools that facilitate democratic engagement, chatbots, content moderation tools, recommendation algorithms, search functions, news ag uh, aggregation tools, voice assistant tools, they may be less effective, less nuanced, uh, and, and uh, less effective in languages other than standard English. Uh, these realities can impair democratic engagement. There's also this piece that folks are familiar with, but I think we got to put it out there, which is kind of the political, cultural bias here in terms of locking in frameworks, language, political perspectives of a shrinking share of the population by kind of scraping the web for pictures and text and accepting them as representative, you know, there are real questions about are we kind of entrenching, um, you know, hierarchy that has existed in the past. Um, so now, I'm, I won't get into law, I'm currently looking at it. My sense is that these challenges aren't adequately prevented by the Voting Rights Act or state deceptive practices law. So I'm going to quickly just take two minutes and turn toward principles to mitigate these harms. A lot of these, I've kind of looked at some existing principles. You see down there at the bottom, White House and Lawyers Committee had, had a piece. Um, Sonia uh, has, a, has a decent law review article. Try to tailor them to the race uh, context uh, here. Um, so, um, you know, I, I, I do want to say that a lot of this is about value judgments as we kind of move down this path before I just get into the details of this uh, here. It's not inevitable that AI has to operate a particular way. Just like the law, this is a social construction. It's not just natural. It doesn't just happen. Uh, AI technologies, um, you know, people who design and deploy the technologies in the context of democracy either directly or indirectly, make value judgments about the cost of collateral harms like the proliferation of cultural anxiety and racial polarization, the chilling effects of surveillance uh, on marginalized communities, uh, entrenchment, accept acceptable rate of ex uh, erroneous exclusion of ballots cast by legitimate voters, uh, and folks do this in the absence of law and how and if the law responds to shape these normative judgments reflects our values about a racially inclusive democracy, right? 
So now, in terms of these principles, as I just kind of quickly uh, go through them, one kind of says, hey, let's anticipate, mitigate, assess these harms. A second one uh, focuses on the algorithmic uh, discrimination issue, issues that we've talked about. I'm sorry. A third would focus on data privacy protections. I think that's really uh, essential when we talk about, um, you know, hyper nudging, when we talk, you know, there's so many as aspects of this that get into data privacy that disproportionately affects communities of uh, color. Uh, a fourth principle would focus on process, good process that's accessible to uh, everyone and not just certain folks. Uh, fifth principle uh, focuses on reducing racial impersonation and racial uh, infiltration and polarization and targeted threats that come from, from uh, deception uh, here. Uh, a sixth recognizes that the combination of racial segregation, racially polarized voting, and local administration of elections creates unique vulnerabilities in terms of U.S. democracy and ensures that uh, local election offices that are particularly vulnerable have the resources that they need to address targeted threats. Uh, a seventh principle focuses on meaningful enforcement and accountability uh, here. One example would be resurrecting the pre-clearance uh, provision uh, nationwide to really require federal review of all districts and all voting restrictions that are created uh, with AI, including a review of, uh, you know, the, the data sets and algorithms used to produce uh, the, the maps and uh, rules uh, here. So, appreciate the opportunity to share and, and look forward to our, our back and forth, our discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Spencer. And those of you online, please uh, put your questions in the Q and A, and they'll they'll magically appear on my phone. Um, let, let, let's start with first principles here, which is, you know, AI is in some way it's one of I've called a keystone technology, right? It's 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 kind of like it's not just one thing, but it's you know pervasive in its application. So it's more like. You know, some people have compared it to electricity, some compare it to like even the alphabet. Right. In thinking of, of, of contemporary, or which is to say last 50 years or more of uh, uh, technological changes, you know, is it like the computer, is it like the internet? All of which have had racial impacts, right? So technological development, depending on how it's, um, how pervasive it is, how equally uh, available, as well as then how it's used by good and bad groups. So that AI, you know, principally what AI does is it amplifies the abilities of all good and bad actors in the system to achieve all the same goals that they've always had. And I think that's consistent with, with the story that you're, you're saying here. And so um, what, what do we, uh, sort of what mistakes do you think have been made in the way we've thought about the racial impacts of the most recent technologies? This is sort of where you, where you started that really, you know, if you could turn back the clock, um, that you would change them, and then what's the lesson really here uh, for, in particular, say, the companies, because you've got, also online here, you've got some people from the companies um, who, you know, if they were to make one personnel change, one rule change, um, to try to, you know, structurally prevent some of these harms that you're identifying, what should they do? Yeah, I appreciate it. So, I really think acknowledging and anticipating this is an issue and looking out for it is just job one. It's so easy to basically say, well, you know, hey, we can't do that under the law, can we? I don't know that we can. Hey, we, you know, or, you know, this is gonna impair somebody's First Amendment interests. And, and I definitely think that we should follow the Constitution and uh, those are important things, but you know, we're making judgments about how are we going to spend our creative energy here. Is it solely going to be based on how do we move into a particular market before someone else? Mm -hmm. uh, or is it going to also involve how do we kind of mitigate harms? Obviously, as law people, we focus on what should government be doing in terms of mitigating harms, right? But also, private sector actors have significant roles. When we think about 
basis of our economy, right? You know, first 60 years of the 1800s, first six decades, right? Majority of our imports, or I'm sorry, exports, cotton, right? We basically displaced China and India as a result of enslaved labor, using enslaved labor, and we benefited from that as a society, but it had some ne negative externalities and, and costs, right? If we think about global warming, uh, similar uh, type of thing. So uh, obviously, we love the Industrial Revolution. Obviously, it's great that the United States has an important place in the world, but I think recognizing this as an externality and how can we be conscious of it as opposed to just saying, hey, I'm not racist because I don't pay attention to race. So l let me like probe what it means if you're, because you've got students here who are developing large language models. Right. You know, you've got people who've worked in the companies. Um, and let, let's, let me, j just to sort of put our finger on the notion of bias and what we think right. about, let's say, with disparate impact yeah. with and bias with AI. Yeah. So one of the early kind of, I don't want to say tropes, but but examples of this had to do with how queer the responses to queries and image generation models, right. and whether they uh, led to prototypical uh, uh, black images. girls, white girls kind of issues. Well, let, let, let me j just okay. to, so if I put into ChatGPT, uh -huh. draw me a, or into Midjourney or Dolly, okay. right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Draw me a picture of a nurse. Mm -hmm. All right, and it almost always is drawing a woman. Right. We can say all right. Some allegations say, well, that is bias. Right? Ju I'm just giving a, a, you know, an a example that's the familiar to people. Um, and you can think of other things when it comes to race. What's the right answer? Right? So, so it, you, you have mm -hmm. technology that is based off, as you said, a certain type of training data. Right. We can say whether yep. there's bias in the training data. Yep. But you also, it, it's, it's a little bit different than, say, the racial discrimination arguments when it comes to social media feeds where the argument is maybe that it's you know leading to targeting and the it's like all right so if you're advising open ai on what the responses should be in dolly um, to a query about nurses how should they deal with in this case we're talking about gender discrimination but it could also be with respect to racial discrimination what should they be doing right um, so nate you know here's the concern that i have with that problem or the 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 question right my concern is the limitation to bias, right, in terms of this notion of, okay, the goal is for just, hey, nurses to be of any gender or people of color to be of any background and like, mm -hmm. hey, just eliminating bias being the only goal. I don't think that that should be the only goal. I mean, I think that that's I, I don't right. want to suggest that. And I'm not, and I'm not saying yeah, that yeah. You, you are. Yeah, I yeah. just think it's important to put it out there to kind of push us past. When we say that over 90% of video deepfakes are women mm -hmm. uh, here, right? Uh, that's a gender issue that's not just like a discrimination issue, that's a, a very gendered issue, and we need to focus on that in the unique context of gender, right? Mm -hmm. In terms of our society changing and possibly recognizing this concept of a multiracial democracy, not just a, hey, we formally don't discriminate, but now that we're diverse, we have these tiers and everybody knows really what's going on in terms of who's in what tier. Mm -hmm. I, I think that we want to say, no, we want a multiracial democracy where people, I think we want to affirmatively have some norms where it's like we want people of different backgrounds to, you know, connect with one another, coalesce with one another in terms of building political coalitions, that those are affirmative goods. And so, I, I think my big thing would be just how do we not limit it to this kind of formal, very kind of formalistic notion of bias as the only thing that we're we're dealing with. And I'm not saying I'm not yeah, putting no, it on you or attributing I, I'm, it to I, you. I'm I'm yeah. really talking to everyone in terms of their 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 focus on on bias. Well, right? I I raise that just as an example of where you can see the most pronounced impact, sort of racial harms. Right is if AI furthers stereotyping, right? right? And so you can okay. think about whether, you know, right. if, you, if, if you ask it to, um, uh, well, I'll give you an example that, that one of my colleagues mentioned. Um, when 
I don't know if this is still true with the model, but if you asked it to draw an Indian, you know, South Asian Indian right. uh, uh, in a particular role, it was always with very traditional dress, right. was what, right. was what, what, right. what the image model was returning, right? And, you know, that was, that's a very limited and stereotype. Yeah, that's, I think right. that's right. Um, you can think of with, you know, if you say draw an African American, do, or, or if you say certain professions, certain, certain uh, behaviors, and then it returns, I don't want to say caricatured photos, but but right. like um, uh, stereotypes. Yep, definitely. All right, so those are examples of w of di of discrete right. pot potential right. impact. Certainly not the whole. I mean, look, right. that, that's not going to deal with the problem of of selective racial yeah. targeting and advertising or something like that. But if if you're working at one of the firms or if you're right. telling them how to have a more kind of um, civil rightsy bent to yeah. the the way that they're thinking about the product. Then what do you what do you tell them on on sort of how to how to address that level of bias? Right. So I think my thought here, and you know, I'm I'm a law and race guy as opposed to a tech guy, right? In terms of uh, how things work behind the scenes, but uh, but I would say that okay, those are issues, and how do we whether it is kind of be better foundation models, whether it's you know some differences in terms of algorithms. How do we deal with that problem? To me, that is the smoking gun mm -hmm. basic problem that's used to indict tech, right? And so to me, it seems like everyone should have an interest in terms of dealing with that. What I'm saying is that to me, the challenges are much bigger in terms of our society and country as a whole and kind of pushing people to those bigger challenges uh, here that we're talking about in terms of the potential of language models to kind of shape and stratify here, mm -hmm. not just on stereotypical depictions of people, mm -hmm. which are very, very important, but to what extent the products serve uh, different uh, communities, to what extent communities can connect with one another, et cetera. Right? So, so l let, me, let me try this a different way, which would be, uh, you know, Kevin Roos, when he was trying to break ChatGPT uh, early on, you know, trained it basically to be a Nazi, right? And, and so it goes back and forth, yep. and, and people look at that and say, oh my God, it, it just has another example of the bias in, in AI. Um, and, you know, when we bring to AI the same frame that we developed, say, in the 2016 right. election with right. Facebook or, right. or, or others, right, we say, all right, well, the, the, the problems here are similar. We need content moderation, just like we have. Is that right? I mean, is there, is there a, a danger mm -hmm. in having a creative tool that allows you to, you know, if you want to jailbreak it, that then you end up, you know, turn it into a biased, gener I mean, how different is that than me just trying to generate that, kinds of stuff on my own, like is that the kind of guardrail that you would see in terms of trying to prevent these models from delivering, you know, racist content that then could be propagated and potentially be used to target, you know, different communities? Um, so I guess, yes, I think the problem I have, like, I was thinking on the po police surveillance piece of pulling something together for that slideshow about, you know, somebody muzzled uh, being, you know, being uh, observed at a Black Lives Matter protest by police, and it, it would not produce that, right? Uh, and so I guess my point is simply that uh, I definitely appreciate the guardrails. I think the guardrails need to be on. That's good. Uh, I think that there could be inadvertent applications of the, the guardrails themselves, and so uh, I, I do think it's much bigger. And, I, and I'm sorry if we haven't pressed down exactly on the particular point uh, that well, but part of it is I, I think that in in dealing with the companies mm -hmm. that and this is not I, and I think it is different than social media I well mean, let, I think let's that talk about that what do you, what do you think about that because I I do think I'm actually personally worried now I'll editorialize a little bit that we are thinking we're wrongfully thinking about AI as if it's just the newest incarnation of Facebook right, right. Where, where it's a very different you know, set of technologies yep. and, and different concerns. Nevertheless, people bring anxieties about mm -hmm. bias and, and hate speech and, and all kinds of other right. things um, into the discussion of AI, and I'm wondering, you know, whether we should treat it that way. And so the examples I'm giving about bias in, in the generation of content right. are one way to think about it. Right. You know, you, you, you're right about about the potential risks of targeting, right? Bec right. But 
that, I mean, that's always, in a, in a sense, been around. And the question is, how can we enable AI to deliver messages? You know, it's just another way of amplifying content, you know, to the relevant populations. Yeah. It's very difficult to see how we're going to get the benefits of AI without those particular kinds of costs. Right. Well, I mean, with all these, the question is how, we, how do we mitigate costs? Mm -hmm. Or negative Risk, yeah. e externalities, negative externalities. That's, that's always a, a big uh, question. But I think the monetization issue, you know, I mean, obviously the social media, how we monetize it in terms of eyeballs is different. I don't know, mm -hmm. maybe you know the monetization issue, uh, you know, in terms of it being different. I think something else is different. and. I think this I kind of got from you, and mm -hmm. one of the reasons I kind of framed this is that this is beyond deep fakes. And to me, a lot of the analogy with social media and content moderation, et cetera, is kind of focused on kind of the overlap in terms of deep fakes mm -hmm. and disinformation and deception and, and all of these other applications and their problems. Um, have to be addressed as well in terms of AI. So mm -hmm. I, I think that the analogy is too limiting in terms of social media, which is which is why it's difficult for me to say, okay, here's exactly how it's different, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you know, here's how we should regulate it differently than we should approach social media. And obviously, we still haven't figured out how to regulate social media. Um, I, I want to open it up to, to folks in the room. We have some questions also that have already come over um, uh, the, the Zoom transom, but let's start with Rihanna Pfefferkorn. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I, I do think that there is a role for the federal government here. You know, when I talk about the concept of uh, how do we deal with that issue of targeting particular localities, one is getting federal uh, resources from DHS to support those localities. So I think that just as we look at some other, you know, we have other enforcement mechanisms that rely on the federal government to deal with state actors who harm U.S. citizens. You know, those are some capacities we've got to to build up. I agree with you that that's an issue. But but let me actually just—it's not really a pushback. It's this, I, and other people have made this point. I just think the fact that these technologies are so accessible to so many people. And obviously, when we talk about uh, natural language prompts, that's one piece. But also the fact that so many local police uh, jurisdictions, for example, can surveil protests in a way they couldn't before simply because the lower costs and the vendors that are available to them, uh, that, you know, that means that uh, there are these kind of uh, it, yeah, the big actors are incredibly important, but I think that the small and, you know, the, the varied actors are also an issue that may be different than in the past. And then we'll go to Dave Wilmer, who I've given my mic to, but so I can uh, get, get that mic. Yeah. Uh, hi, thanks for coming. This was, this was excellent. Um, maybe pushing a little more on, on some of what I think Nate was trying to get at, there are there are likely going to be mitigations here that are sort of zero sum inseparable trade offs. Mm -hmm. So, like a, a really simple example we faced was the question of fiction, mm -hmm. right? Um, it, these tools can be super helpful to let, help people write books, generate mm -hmm. uh, essays. Mm -hmm. We obviously want books and essays about things like racial right. violence and discrimination. Right. When we're putting guardrails into the models, the models are often very blunt. And so, you're sort of faced with either creating a disparate impact in terms of what narratives they can be helped to generate or like leaving a door open on, on sort of problematic offensive use. I, I don't expect an answer on that, right. but it's sort of worth thinking through as you yeah. grapple yeah. with this. So I, I appreciate that flag in terms of the work. I will say that 
as you can appreciate, I just don't think there's a silver bullet. Some of this is the work in and of itself in terms of how do you do those trade-offs, right? Well, I think part of the challenge here is to develop um, auditing mechanisms mm -hmm. to really understand what the impact is. I mean, I, I, you know, this borrows on some of the transparency work that I was doing with social media, but it's different in the context of AI, but which is that we really don't have a sense about how people are using these tools and um, what the, how the models perform. I mean, um, there is, I think, another, I don't wanna call it zero sum, another trade-off here, which is that if, for example, we were to constrain the models and the, what they, they could produce, um, there is a common critique. We've seen it actually today in a in a uh, Senate committee report or a House committee report that came out about concerns about woke AI. All right, yeah. and so one of the things that I think we're uh, and, and I'm borrowing from uh, Dave Wilner here also that that we may have a six to twelve month window until AI uh, falls into the culture wars, right. right? And so that that it has been somewhat immune, there's kind of bipartisan efforts here. Uh, it looks like there's some uh, chance maybe for some, some push ahead, but once it becomes, it falls into the kind of matrix we've developed with respect to say social media, then it's sort of, you know, all bets are off. And so as you think about like the constraints one would put on the technology, there is a pushback that what right. you are doing is inserting a certain type of ideolo ideological bias right. into um, you know, language models or, in, or AI generally that's going to um, advantage some voices and disadvantage others. Right. And I think that this is something that I really have to grapple with in terms of acknowledging the harms of the status quo mm -hmm. and am I like inviting this, the same pushback we've seen in terms of critical race theory, et cetera. Right. Am I just kind of fueling a fire here uh, so that, that those critiques uh, come sooner rather than later. Well, but I think, I think it's, um, again, the, the starting point is to try to figure out what we think a kind of like fair AI system looks like, right, as compared to what we may have right now. And so the, the point about bias in the, in the training data is I think a very important one. Um, and and then thinking about, all right, whether it's through legal regulation or whether the platform should be doing, or whether we have sort of outside checks on this. This mm -hmm. is, goes back to the audits. And I, I can't remember, did you participate in one of these civil rights audits with one of the platforms? I know we uh, yeah, had spoken yeah, about with yeah. you at, with at some point, with Facebook, Meta. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and so I don't know whether your experience in dealing with those kinds of civil rights audits makes you think about how we should think about um, you know, auditing these platforms or, or enforcing against them. Yeah, go on. Does do, I mean do, do, does does tell you sort of about your experiences in in that? Does that so so basically, you know, Laura Murphy did uh, Facebook, and before that, she did Airbnb, and so you know, was one of the civil rights groups that kind of worked with her in terms of going and meeting in terms of Facebook. To a certain extent, did some work in terms of Google, their internal piece, but it wasn't like an external uh, audit uh, here. Um, and very frankly, even though they don't get credit for it, I think the Facebook, you know, audit was much more rigorous than the Google uh, uh, audit uh, here, uh, and independent. And I, I do think there's this question: to what extent should we do audits in terms of um, these? Um, AI companies, I, I think that that's a good point, and I, I think it's something I just need to think about more deeply. As you said in your presentation, I also think there will be lessons learned in the AI Act in Europe as mm -hmm. to yep. how you know we, we deal with bias. So, question down here. Yeah, first, thanks for the nice talk. Thanks. My question, I guess, is about localizing, you could say localizing responsibility, mm -hmm. or, or localizing a place in the pipeline where we can make a fix. Because when you think about the pathway to the kinds of harm that you describe, it's like a long pipeline. You know, we start with a whole bunch of data on the internet, right. a company that's aggregating that data, that's training a foundation model, the foundation model gets specialized to some particular task, and then perhaps it gets targeted at some system like an election office right. in order to cause harm there. Um, what thoughts do you have about like how to identify the right parts of the pipeline to focus our efforts on? Mm -hmm. 
So I think one of the reasons I wanted to tee this up in this way is because I don't know that folks were focused on like, I don't know that everybody knows is that race is the most significant factor in terms of driving voting choices or is a great proxy in terms of determining outcomes. So I think it was to look a little bit more uh, downstream uh, here at these issues and, and how they can affect outcomes. So um, for me, thinking about incentives of actors uh, their incentives to acquire power or to move ahead is really important, especially once you kind of get outside of, uh, you know, move into the so-called real world. So I think that the incentives piece is incredibly important. Uh, be great to talk a little bit more one-on-one -on -one in terms of that. Let me follow up with you in terms of the last piece. I think this infrastructure inside a company to deal with it so it's not just a report that happens occasionally is important. So, you know, I know Roy isn't always held up, Austin, you know, but, but the fact that he's there at Meta, I think is important from an institutional standpoint to be, a, so I think that that is certainly an example of something AI companies could emulate uh, here. So I wanna, uh, unless there's another question. And, and, and I'm sorry, what I mean there mm -hmm. is both an institution and expertise internally. Yeah. People kind of assume, hey, technology's complicated, you need training on it. Oh, you don't need training on race or politics, I vote. I've got a black friend or a Latino friend, I don't discriminate, I know race. And I, I think having people with expertise internally is important. So I wanna ask this last question, which is, is a bit of a and I'll do, And I think that also goes to your point uh, as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the, we, we just held a, a large conference here at Stanford last Friday on or open source models. And so one of the things that makes this a little different, mm -hmm. th this, the things, the, one, of the, one of the aspects of AI uh, that makes it different than social media is that it looks like we're not gonna be limited to say a few private companies that have monopoly power over uh, LLMs, but actually there's going to be all of these open source tools mm -hmm. so that whatever responsible actors, even at, whether they're developing the open source uh, models or, or the closed source models, whatever they might put in as guardrails, because this is going to be popularized and people are going to have access to it, they may be able to take away whatever anti-discrimination guardrails you might want to put into right. the technology at the front end. And but so, but don't you think we've seen that in terms of social media as well? May, yeah, well maybe, but at least then you, you know who to point your finger at to blame. Right. Whereas here, um, the technology is going to be so pervasive and available and fine-tuned in many different ways that it's hard to see how one could um, rec uh, regulate the panoply of uses, mm -hmm. this is the electricity example or, or like even the gun example or, or, or some kind of, you know, the more that it's out there in the population, the more that people can adapt it to their own uh, purposes, it's not clear to me that we, we can um, put it back in the bag, right? Mm -hmm. That you're going to be able to address the discriminatory impact of the new technology once it's essentially in everybody's pocket. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and your take is that that is not something that we could regulate. Uh, well, it's, it's hard to see how one could. I mean, because you've got large language, open source large language models that are being developed, you know, by the French government, the right. UAE government, let alone uh, Facebook, right? Or, right. you know, Meta with, with Llama 2 and, and the, it's, uh, you know, the next Llama baby, whatever that will be. Mm -hmm. uh, and so as much as we might take to this, the paradigm of like regulating industries or regulating platforms that are causing harm um, in, a, in terms of their racial impacts, it's actually gonna be, it's ultimately gonna fall to people, right? People are going to, to uh, good and bad actors are gonna have access to this technology. We see this, for instance, we have you know, a big report that's coming out of Stanford Internet Observatory on child pornography. It's like, you can try to, you can, you can um, have an image generation tool that you don't really want to, to develop that kind of terrible stuff, mm -hmm. but once you make it open source and people have the ability to generate right. any image they want, they could do they can do that, which is what we're seeing. It's totally right. destabilizing right. the right. infrastructure we have. That, let alone racist imagery or anything else that um, th that falls into the categories you're talking about, including marrying it with social media so that you get you know targeting and and a lot of crap that that goes over people's news feeds. Right. So, but. 
are you saying that we can't regulate that in terms of the deployment as opposed to the development? I, I can understand yeah, maybe. The, once it's deployed, which it has been already, right. um, then the, it's very little, you know, it, there aren't companies to regulate at that point, right? You could try it on the, right. on the back end, right. but even that's gonna be hard because, you know, the models themselves seem, I mean, they're very powerful, but they don't seem like inherently racially biased or, you know, right. or, or amenable to this. It's just, as I said before, it amplifies the abilities of good and bad actors to achieve all the goals that they wanted to achieve. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you just have to sort of bite the bullet and say, all right, is that kind of empowerment, when it could be used in populist ways, you know, um, uh, you know, something that we're going to allow or not? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think there is this question, though, is so do we just kind of throw up our hands and give up here and go have Good. some margaritas or some <laughs> coffee here? On that note, we've run out of time. Uh, 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 please join me in thanking Spencer Overton. <laughs> it's an interesting question. And oh, uh, and, and, and next week we've got Rishi Bomasami. Uh, from Stanford, uh, uh, talking about a lot of, uh, he's done foundational work on foundation models and regulation of them. So please join us then. <laughs>